best kind of scare is the kind that reaches beyond the boundaries of its own fiction to really mess with our minds. As if it's not already enough of a mess up there. From powerful meta scares to skin crawlingly odd details, these are the nightmare fuel moments from video games that messed with our mind in unexpected ways. With big thanks to Aaron Murray, whose Twitter thread on creepy facts about games inspired this video. I say with big thanks, but having seen the following things, we're never sleeping again, so actually we're ambivalent. <laughs> In 2010, a Nintendo Wii horror game named Calling recreated the most terrifying experience of our modern age. Someone calling you on your actual phone without messaging first. Nightmare. The terror doesn't end there on account of how then you are transported through your phone to a ghostly limbo dimension wherein dwell all kinds of eerie apparitions to hebe your jeebies, like these cool dolls. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Elsewhere, you'll encounter aggressive spirits that can only be repelled by furiously waggling your Wii remote like a supercharged smudge stick. And even here, in an otherworldly alternate reality, you can't escape unsolicited phone calls. Even in death, the soul remains. These scam calls are getting worse. As freaky as that all is, at least it's contained within the fiction of the actual game. Things start getting skin-crawlingly meta when you encounter a ghostly girl in a red dress who isn't confined like the other ghosts to a single level, but will occasionally pop up wherever she feels like. Including, but not limited to, when you're just taking a private moment to use the facilities. <gasps> the fun thing about these encounters is that each time you meet the girl in red, you will receive a message from her outside of the game on your Wii message board. Oh good, she found me. So now the girl in red is reaching out to you, the player, from within the game via these sinister messages. And if you collect them all, you'll find a surprise treat waiting for you in the title screen. Oh, interesting. Huh. What's this now? At least she did message me first. This brutal killing took place while the family was gathered at home on a Sunday afternoon. The day of the crime, the father went to the trunk of his car, retrieved the rifle, and shot his wife as she was cleaning up the kitchen after lunch. I used to think corridors were good. If you want a long passageway in a building from which doors lead to other rooms, a corridor's the way to do it, I used to think. And then PT came along. PT, short for Playable Teaser, was just that, a playable teaser for the then-upcoming Silent Hills, a horror game in that classic franchise from director Hideo Kojima featuring Norman Reedus, Guillermo del Toro, and whoever else Hideo Kojima wanted to hang with at the time, probably. I'm guessing Kurt Russell and Depeche Mode. But as good as PT was for video games, it was equally bad for the reputation of Corridors, because almost the entire harrowing game is set in a really horrible one that you endlessly walk along as it loops around and around on itself, occasionally throwing in a terrifying ghost woman to really F you up. <laughs> the game is deliberately convoluted and confusing, and no two people can agree on how to complete it, which only adds to its mystique, along with several spooky easter eggs and jump scares that can be triggered if you do the right or wrong thing at the right time. The cruelest of these, however, have to be the ones that torment you on the game's pause screen, proving that nowhere is safe from PT's insidious spookiness. Leave the game on pause for too long, perhaps because you've gone to get a cup of tea or a handful of Valium to calm yourself down, and you might encounter some backwards talking, like this one, which, when reversed, turns out to be someone talking about their body shaking all over in Spanish. <laughs> Leave it paused for longer than that, perhaps because you're trying to translate some backmasked Spanish, and bad luck! Lisa, the game's ghostly antagonist, will grab you for a short, sharp, shocking game over. How did she know you were hanging out in the pause menu? 
Oh, probably because, as was discovered by players experimenting with camera hacks, it turns out that Lisa is always right behind you, the whole time you're playing the game. And maybe even right now, in real life. <laughs> I knew she wasn't there. Okay. Long before he was crowned king of the DC Cinematic Universe, James Gunn wrote the 2004 Scooby-Doo sequel, Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed. Who's your mommy? He's Batman's boss now. Ahead of the movie's release to stoke cinema-going audiences into a frenzy of anticipation, Warner Brothers Pictures released a point-and-click flash game named Scooby-Doo Escape from the Coolsonian, in which the titular Great Dane had to escape from the titular museum by solving a series of puzzles. These puzzles were set in three of the Coolsonian Museum's prize exhibitions, one on zombies, one on ghosts, and one on mummies. <laughs> The deal with the Coulsonian Museum, in case you were wondering, was that it housed a collection of the various spooky costumes worn by Scooby-Doo villains prior to being unmasked by the Scooby Gang. And why did they name their gang after someone's terrified dog? The point, though, is that Scooby-Doo 2 Escape from the Coulsonian is a promotional game aimed primarily at children in the hopes that said children will bug their parents to take them to see the associated movie. Which is precisely why no one playing this innocuous looking game, pointing and clicking their way through a series of ancient Egyptian flavoured tile puzzles, will be psychologically prepared for the following. of a screaming skeletal face so sudden and jarring that we assume if you saw it as a child back in 2004, you never went to a museum again. Or to see the Scooby-Doo 2 movie, for that matter. All in all, no one expected a game based on a family-friendly movie about a big CG dog to include the most devastating jump scare of all time, including the thing when you're coming downstairs and miss a stare. You got a lot to answer for, James Gunn. Don't do anything to attract attention. Hello, baby. Batman's boss. There's a rumor laughter's on its way. Smile, you're on Game Boy Camera. Yes, with Game Boy Camera, you can turn photography into photography. Smile, you're on Game Boy Camera. Nowadays, with mobile phones, everyone has a digital camera in their pocket. Back in 1998, if you wanted the same thing, you needed one of these. And also very big pockets. Released a whole nine years after the Game Boy itself, the Game Boy camera plugged directly into the cartridge slot of Nintendo's all-conquering handheld, and offered the ability to take black and white photos in a resolution of 128 by 112 pixels, which is over 500 times less than the number of pixels on your fancy 4K TV. The Game Boy camera came with built-in software that allowed you to insert yourself into games by taking a photo like so, the Game Boy Camera could then use those photos in mini-games, like sticking your head on Mr. Game & Watch, or this DJing game where a set of DJ decks plays bleepy electronic music while you wave your hands ineffectually over the top of them. You know, like Tiesto, allegedly. Inexplicably, the menu for the part of the game that actually allowed you to take photos was also dressed up to look like a game, specifically a JRPG. So in addition to the menu option to shoot photos, there were extra JRPG style menu options like items and magic, and also run. <music> Clicking on this option usually displayed a jaunty message about crossing the equator and played some cheery music. Every so often though, clicking on run would display a messed up looking face with ominous music and the sinister message, who are you running from? Whoever it is, they are 100% going to catch me with this thing in my pocket. I can't run with this, I can barely walk. Help! 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 In my restless dreams, I see that town, Silent Hill.
most of the time in Silent Hill 2, when you're afraid of something, at least you know why you're afraid. No! And yes, it usually is because there's a guy with a pyramid for a head chasing you around with a big knife. Some of the scariest things in Silent Hill 2, however, are the things you can't explain, such as the strange noises you can hear in various places throughout the game. Take the women's bathrooms in Toluca Prison, which James encounters on his journey through everyone's favourite foggy hell town. Sorry, London. Venture inside the bathroom and you'll be presented with three stalls, two of which are open and empty, one of which is locked shut. Interact with this door and you can knock on it, but you won't get an answer, no matter how many times you try. Walk away from the door, though, and you will finally get your response. A terrifying crashing sound and a scream that indicates something terrible has happened behind the door, which, of course, remains locked. If that's not sufficient to freak your nut, then why not head to room 209 at the Blue Creek Apartments, where you can hear someone unseen whispering something that we can't quite make out, but we're pretty sure includes the words, dead wife. Thanks for the spoilers, disembodied voice. Honestly, some people. You like that, board me? Huh? You want seconds? For many young kids, their teddy bear is their most beloved companion. They might even wish it would come to life. It's only when they become adults that they realise how fucking terrifying that would be. Call of Duty Black Ops 2 developer Treyarch definitely knows. That's why in Black Ops 2's intense zombies mode, there's a creepy easter egg involving living teddy bears. Not sure exactly what it was about this mode where the undead run at you screaming that made Treyarch think, no, I think this needs to be more scary. For those unfamiliar with the increasingly weird Call of Duty zombies lore, and who have no idea what a pack-a-punch machine or juggernog is, one of the key mechanics in the mode is the mystery box, which you pay to open and that serves up a random weapon, some more useful than others. I don't want to sound ungrateful, but a sniper rifle isn't exactly what I need when I have eight zombies about three inches from my face. One thing you should know about the mystery box is that occasionally you'll get a teddy bear instead of a weapon. Another thing you should know about the mystery box is that it can't be relied on to stay in the same place in the level. So if a teddy bear does pop out instead of a weapon, then bad luck, the box will be whisked away to another spawn point on the map, leaving only the stuffed teddy to mark where the previous spawn point was. Hang around long enough staring at the bear, which isn't terribly likely when you're being chased by a ravening horde of zombies, and you'll notice that on rare, creepy occasions, the teddy will reveal that it's secretly alive, silently looking around for a moment with its beady little eyes before returning to its previous seemingly inanimate pose. The stuff of nightmares, as opposed to what the bear is filled with, which is the stuffing of nightmares. Fatal Frame, or Project Zero as it's known in Japan, is a series of survival horror games in which the enemies are ghosts, and you can only harm them through use of a paranormal camera. Presumably by tagging them in unflattering Instagram photos that they then have to run off and untag themselves in before anybody sees. One thing that a lot of games in the series have in common is a particular fondness for scaring people who leave the game idle for too long. Now, there might be plenty of reasons that you have to leave a Fatal Frame game idle. Perhaps the doorbell went, or perhaps you're trying to figure out how to duct tape a camera to a broomstick to fashion an impromptu club. Well, whatever the reason for you leaving the game idle, Fatal Frame isn't having any of it, and begins to overlay scary things over the gameplay, like the world's most disturbing screensaver. In the first game, it's bloody handprints that start covering the action. In the second game, on the other hand, there's a ghostly face staring directly at you. And then the third game features a ghostly face staring directly at you. Great. 
Look, if your video game is a ring tape that's going to kill me in seven days, then you have to say so on the box, Fatal Frame. Pretty sure that's a law. Sorry, I'm busy using Game Boy Camera, which I'm convinced is going to be the next big thing in like online social media filters. Everyone looks good on the Game Boy Camera because no one can discern any visible features. Um, if you've enjoyed this video, uh, please do consider watching some of our other great videos. One from us up here, one from our sister channel, Outside Extra. And if you'd like to support the things we do, why not check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash oxclub. It helps us make these things and do stupid stuff like buying Game Boy cameras on eBay. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.